happy Thanksgiving week end. Did you enjoy your Thanksgiving? You know, I'm so thankful for you. And you are family. Did you know that? We're family. And I started a series last week called Thank You. And it's just teaching some principles, principles about being grateful and, and, and thankful. And, but I want to warn you. There's, there's a force that will ruin your joy, rob you of peace, rob you of contentment. There's a force out there. It's called complaining. It's called complaining. And, and listen, we're all pretty good at it, aren't we? Aren't we? I mean, let's just bring it down to specifics, down to Menifee. Uh, we complain about, well, there's too many people moving in. The traffic's horrible. People are rude here. We, we hear those things, but you know what? Across from coast to coast, you'll hear the same thing in every city. And it's because people complain. And, and here, here's, here's an interesting observation. There are times when we're grow, going through difficulties, tough times, that it, it seems reasonable to complain. It, it just, you know, it seems reasonable to complain. You're, you're in despair. You're in a dark place. You're at a, at a tough, tough time, a trial, a tribulation. And it just seems okay to complain. But the problem with that is it can lead to a life of bitterness and a life of resentment. Being thankful during tough times doesn't mean that you and I are a glutton for punishment. Being thankful during tough times doesn't mean that uh, we're to be thankful for evil. No. No, it, it's not pretending that there's nothing wrong when there's something very, very wrong. It's not pretending. It's not ignoring the trouble, the trial. But here's what it is. Being thankful during tough times is a choice. Can you say that? Is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice to stop focusing on, on your problems and instead focus on God and what God is doing, the work that he's doing through that difficulty. It's making that choice. And I just think that it, it, it's uh, natural. Some of you might be offended by that, but it seems to be a natural thing for human beings to look at things in a negative manner, to complain. It, I didn't say it's right, but it seems to be natural. And here's what James says. I'd like you to open your Bibles to James chapter 1. Your Bible, your smart device. I have most of the scriptures up on the screen. But the ones I don't, I have in your notes in the bulletin. So make sure, or our church app, if you can get on there, you'll see the notes there. James 1, 2, 4 says, Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. I'm going to stop there because... <laughs> Doesn't that sound crazy, absurd almost? Consider it a great joy, my brothers, whenever you experience various trials. It's like, oh great, I'm going to have a hard time this week. I'm looking forward to it. It's not really saying that. But what James is saying is, consider it great joy, my brothers, when you experience various trials. And then he goes in to define or explain. He says, knowing that the testing, here we go, of your faith produces endurance. And but but endurance, endurance must do its complete work, so that you may be mature and complete lacking nothing. So it's not for naught when we go, when we go through difficulties. It, it, James is not saying, hey, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great complaining. It doesn't say that. It, it, it says you should consider it an opportunity for joy. And listen, some of you are going through stuff right now whether it's medical issues, relational fractures, job issues, just maybe trying to figure out what's next in life. And, and if you're not going through anything right now and it's, you're kind of at a peace place, thank God for that, amen? But, you know, eventually you're going to go through difficult times. That's just life. It's just life. But listen, I want you to understand something. When we go through those seasons of difficulty, when things aren't, go in the way that we'd hope, and, and almost where it's like shaking your faith. God is doing something in you. Let him do that. Let him do that. Now, do, do you have certain movies that you like to watch during 
different times of, of the season that you kind of go to. It's like a default. Uh, uh, you know, if it's Christmas time, you go to these certain movies that you like or, or Thanksgiving. One of the movies I liked, during, and you're going to think I'm crazy, but one of the movies I liked during Thanksgiving time, and I watched it the other night, it's called Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. It's an older movie. It's with Steve Martin and John Candy. It's a classic, and it's a Thanksgiving-themed movie, and that's why I love it. And there's a clip in that movie where John Candy and Steve Martin, they, they've gone through all this trouble. Their car's caught on fire. I mean, they're just one bad thing after another. They're trying to get home. John Candy's trying to get Steve Martin home so he can have a Thanksgiving with his family. And there's all kinds of dynamics going on. But they're at a point where they're in this car. It's caught on fire. It barely runs. And I want you to watch this video, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Great, great, pop. Watch it. How fast are you going? I can't tell. The speedometer's melting. Pull over. Top of the morning, officer. Hi. Is there something I can help you with? In here. We had a small fire last night, but we caught it in the nick of time. <laughs> you have any idea how fast you were going? Well, funnily enough, I was just talking to my friend about that. Our speedometer's melted, and as a result, it's very hard to say with any degree of accuracy exactly uh, how fast we were going. 78 miles an hour. 78, huh? Well, yeah, I could buy that, sure, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, you would know better than us, uh, especially since we got a melted speedometer. Do you feel this vehicle is safe for highway travel? Yes, I do. Yes, I really do. I, I, I believe that. I know it's not pretty to look at, but it'll get you where you want to go. Now, you got no outside mirror. No, we lost that. You have no functioning gauges. No, not a one. However, the radio still works. Funny <laughs> as that may seem, with all this mess, that the radio is the only thing that's really working good, and it's as clear as a bell. Don't ask me how. <laughs> I can't let you go ahead in this vehicle. Can't what? No, it's not fit for the road. The vehicle will be impounded until such time as it can be made safe for travel on state highways. Okay, officer, I admit it. I, I, I broke the law, and, and for that, I'm really sorry. I am. It'll never happen again. I, you got me there, and I won't argue with you one iota, I swear. However, um, if you impound our car, I'm going to be unable to get my friend here home in time for his Thanksgiving dinner. I love that scene. What, what were they thankful for? The radio. Hey, the radio works, and it works great. It's crystal clear. I love that scene because there's so much to complain about there. The car barely moves. It's burned up. None of the gauge works. None of the gauges work, but the radio works. A great example uh, that, you know, I, I believe God blesses us when we focus on the good things. And listen, there are always good things in our situation. Now, how can you give thanks during tough times? And you see it on the screen. I can give thanks because God is in control. God is in control. What happens when you're in control? It doesn't go too good, does it? But God's in control. No matter what you're facing in life, God is in control. The God of the heavens, the, the, the creator of the universe, the Lord of heaven and earth, he's in control of everything and... He deeply loves you and I. That's good news. Here's what King David said in Psalm 103, 19. It says, the Lord has made the heavens his throne. And from there, he rules over what? Everything. He rules over everything. And even when we don't fully understand how, how the things are going in our life, and it seems like they're upside down at times, it's difficult to grasp that God's in control, but God is in control of everything. Now, hear me out on this. That doesn't mean that God causes everything. He's in control of everything, but he doesn't cause everything. God certainly doesn't cause anything evil. Listen to me. If you or someone you love gets cancer, or you lose your job, or your spouse leaves you, uh, walks out on you, that doesn't mean that God caused that. Uh, those things happen in this world because we live in a fallen world. It's, it, listen, it's because of my sin. It's because of your sin. Those things happen. But in the midst of that, God is there. He's in control. 
And, and he, even though we go through tough times, uh, God can still bring something good out of that. Did you hear that? God can turn problems into possibilities. He can turn troubles into triumphs. He knows everything that's happening in our world. And he knows everything that's happening in our life. And he deeply loves you and I. God loves you and I. Uh, this is how much God loves you and I. It's in Matthew chapter 10. The Gospel of Matthew 29 through 31. It says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head, they're all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are more of more value than many sparrows. And, and what the gospel writer is saying here is, is God's in control. And, and he, he knows everything that's going on. And listen, you and I are more valuable than even a sparrow. And he's aware when the sparrow is having a hard time. And so God is in control. He loves you. And, and I just love that. And so I want to give you some things to be thankful for. You're, we can be thankful that God's in control. And number two, I can give thanks because God's promises, they're always true. God's promises, they're always true. They're always true. God never breaks his word. People, on the other hand, they lie. They break their word. But God never does. In Numbers, it's in the Old Testament, it's in your notes. Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it says that God is not a man, so he does not lie. He's not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? Listen, if you don't feel like you have anything else to be thankful for during this time, you can be thankful that God is true. His His word is true. His promises are true. And you might be sitting here this, this morning and thinking, well, okay, I buy that, but how do I know his promises? I, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Because God's promises are plentiful, and they're found in God's word, the Bible. And we've got a Bible from cover to cover. You've got 60 bo uh, 66 books. You've got an Old Testament, a New Testament, and, and some scholars say there's 7,000 plus Seven to 8,000 uh, promises, depending on how you define what a promise is. That is a lot of promises. But the only way that you and I are going to be aware of God's promises is by examining the Word of God. The Word of God is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. We've got to get into God's Word and to understand that uh, not only is he in control, but his promises are, are true. And God always keeps his promises. He'll never let you down. People will let you down. And, and sometimes you'll, ask, you'll come across someone who doesn't go to church anymore. And, and they'll have a story. Why? And a lot of times it's because, well, the pastor let him down or someone in church let him down. Another Christian let him down. And so they don't want to have anything to do with organized religion. And, and I don't know that organized religion is all that good, but we don't always represent God very well. And we make mistakes. We're sinners. But God stands on his own. And that doesn't diminish the fact that the church, the body of Christ, is a beautiful thing beautiful thing because it's the body of Christ. It's not a building. It's not a pastor. It's not leaders in the church. It's not people that call themselves uh, members. The body of Christ are followers of Jesus and they're imperfect people. They make mistakes, but God stands on his own. He's perfect. He doesn't lie. His promises are true. When God says uh, he loves you, he means it. When he says he's with you, he's with you. When you're going through a trial in a difficult time and you feel alone and isolated, God is right there. He loves you. And whatever you're going through, whatever you're experiencing, God has you there to learn to glean, to gain wisdom. And it becomes uh, a great, great almanac of information to help others once you go through it. Here's the key. When you're in trouble, when your back's against the wall, when you're going through difficulties, the key is to get through it, right? Can you say get through it? You don't want to stay there. You want to get through it on the other side. And God promises you will. You'll get through it. 
You might say, well, hey, I'm having medical issues, and, and it doesn't look too good, and, and, and I'm going to die, and this is real, very real stuff to you, and, and, and that's not the end. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, when you die, that's the beginning. And so that erases the fear. The devil wants you to be uh, guilt-ridden, and he wants you to be consumed with fear about the situation you're in, but God's given you victory. We can be thankful that God's in control. We can be thankful that, that for so many things uh, uh, about God, that his promises are true. We can give thanks because there are people who support us. You can personalize that. Support me. God created us not to be alone. He's put people in our lives. And when you isolate yourself, you set yourself up for trouble. You really do. God created you to be in community. Uh, and listen, there are people in your life, and there have been people in your life, that you can trust. Think about those who have encouraged you to come to Christ, those who have encouraged you, your Bible study leaders and teachers. I want you to just think about this for a moment, that it's such a selfless act to prepare and to teach others. To, to even open your home up and host a Bible study. That's a selfless act. You are investing in other people. I want you to think about those who invest in you, those who have helped you, maybe when in a time where you've been in trouble and you just felt lonely and, and, and hurt, you hurt, you were in pain, and you were emotionally just disjointed, and, and you just felt like you couldn't even breathe anymore, and then there was that individual or people that encouraged you. I want you to think about them. And I want you to do something, if you would. Could you just close your eyes? I'm not going to have you do anything weird. But just close your eyes for a moment. Think about those individuals that you can count on. And it might be one person, it may be a handful. But think about them. That have invested in you, that have encouraged you, that have said, hey, get up, you can do it, keep moving forward. And just in the quietness of your heart, I want you to do this. I want you to say, God, I thank you for so-and-so for helping me when I was hurting. God, I, I thank you for them. Okay, you can look up at me. I want you to do one more thing this week. Just reach out to him. Maybe it's a note. Maybe it's a text, an email. However you do it, it's okay. But just say, hey, I thank God for you. It makes sense. It's Thanksgiving season, right? We're leading into Christmas. It's a time of giving. Just give them some encouragement and say, hey, I, I thank you for investing in me. I just thank you for being my friend. Look what it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. This is in the Old Testament, verses 9 and 10. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Isn't that true? I've been there. You've been there. It just works better when you've got folks around you. And listen, if you're waiting for perfect, perfect people to be around you, you're going to be waiting a long time. But you got Jesus, he's perfect. And you've got others like you that are imperfect. You just love, you overlook the flaws and the faults, and you love and you help each other. We can thank God for people in our life. We can thank God for his word, his promises are true. We can thank God and thank God, really, because he's in control. And we're not. And finally, I can give thanks because Jesus understands my trouble. This is huge. In the years I've been blessed to be involved in ministry, and the times I've sat with people who have sought some counseling, and typically somebody that wants to uh, just hear from you and get counseling, they're looking for direction. They're looking for some answers. And sometimes they're just looking to just get stuff off their chest. And that's all good. That's all okay. But one of the things I've found in this is that they feel lonely. They feel like they're the only one going through it. They, and there's that sense that nobody really understands what they're going through. And, and I think we've all been there. I, I've been there where I feel like, man, I don't think anybody gets me or understands when you're going through some difficult times. And if you stay there too long, I think it's dangerous. 
So God has, has put people in our lives. And, and, uh, but more importantly, we have Jesus that we can lean on. And he understands our issues, troubles, and trials. And, and, and listen, that's exactly what Christmas is all about. Christmas is in just a few short weeks. And that's what Christmas is all about. It's about God coming near, God coming to earth, Jesus Christ here with us, among us, one of us. And he understands everything. I mean, he understands everything that you and I are going through. You might say, well, how can he understand? He's God's son. He's perfect. He doesn't sin. You're right. But Jesus was 100% God, and he's 100% man. Think about that. He wasn't 50% God and 50% man. He was 100% God, 100% man. And in his humanity, he can sympathize with us. He knows exactly what we're feeling, what we're going through. And don't you think that Jesus went through some stuff? I mean, we always go right to the cross, right? He certainly went through horrific things in the process of being crucified and, and being hung on the cross. But even prior to that, uh, initially when he started his ministry, there were multitudes, thousands of people following Jesus. And then the crowd just got dwindled down because they saw how difficult it was to do the things that Jesus did to follow Jesus. They, the hard sayings of Jesus when he turned around and he said, hey, if you follow me, you're going to be wealthy and rich and drive... Rolls Royce and have a Rolex watch. He didn't say that, by the way. He said, if you follow me, you know, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have a place to lay his head. It's not going to be easy following me, Jesus said. And so the crowd got dwindled down. Do you think that had the, the effect of, of being discouraging? And Jesus didn't sin, but he felt those things. And he was tempted with all the things that we were tempted with, but he didn't fall prey to it because he was sinless. And so we can give thanks because Jesus understands our trouble. Look what it says in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. The high priest being Jesus. He, he, he can sympathize. He knows exactly how we're feeling. But we have one who, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, and yet without sin. And this is saying, whatever we're going through, Jesus knows exactly how you feel. So don't ever feel isolated. Don't ever feel alone. And if you start feeling that way, understand that that can open up doors for the enemy to just hammer you and pour forth his poison of discouragement, despair, depression, and the ultimate end to that is suicide, where you just feel so hopeless, you don't even feel like living anymore. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to destroy us. To combat that is an understanding that Jesus cares. He truly cares, and he understands our trouble. The Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, and he says in 2 Corinthians 4.17, it's in your notes, he says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. And you may feel like you're in something and involved in something and feeling overwhelmed. It may seem so enormous, and yet Paul says our present troubles, they're small. They won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at troubles we see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that, we can't, that cannot be seen. So as followers of Jesus, we, we've got to look beyond where we're at. Whether it's a relationship problem, a health issue, financial struggles, whatever it is, whatever it is, we've got to look beyond that. The enemy wants you to just dwell there and focus on it. But God would have you look to him and look up. You know, I don't know much about flying, but I know this. If you look down and steer down, you're going down. 
right? In fact, you look at that horizon line, you're going to go down eventually. You got to look up. And our looking up, what that really means is we look to Christ. He is our answer. For things we see now will soon be gone, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 17, but the things, 4, 18, but the things we cannot see will last forever. That's heavenly things. That's the love that God has for you. That's forgiveness of sins. You, you can't see that, but you certainly can sense it. That's eternal life. You can't see that, but you can experience it. You see, God loves you. And what I want to do is wrap up this message right now, today, and to be thankful to God with our memory verse. It's in your, your bulletin. Can you take that out? And I'd like you to do one more thing with me. Would you stand to your feet? Now, I want to go back to the beginning of the message. We're good at complaining. It's easy to complain. It's easy to zero in on the negative about anything and everything. And I don't think that that's where God wants you and I to be. And so we have a verse here. Again, it's the Apostle Paul encouraging the church in Corinth and encouraging us. And it's 1 Corinthians 15. 57. And I'd like us to read this out loud because it's a powerful verse. Let's begin. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do that again. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We can thank the Lord. Now listen, you apply this verse right now with whatever you're going through wherever you're at, you apply this verse in the future because if you're not going through a difficulty now, you will be. And I'm not trying to speak anything negative over you. That's just life. We go through life and we go through tough times and we can thank God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you and I praise you for your, your word that it, it challenges us, it encourages us. And God, I know there are people here who are struggling they're struggling, but they're here, and that's a great sign. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us change the way we think, how we perceive, and even how we communicate, that we would look at the good things and give you thanks and know that we have victory through Jesus Christ. And if you believe that, say amen. 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 You may be seated. Listen, there may be somebody here this, this uh, day, today, that uh, doesn't know the Lord. And what I mean by that is, I'm always hesitant to say it like this, but I want to just say, if you're not certain that you'd go to heaven, if you were to die today, if you're not absolutely certain about that, did you know that you can be certain about your eternal destination? The Bible says that when Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you're heaven bound. The Bible says, and Jesus said himself, in the Gospel of John, that you must be born again. And so if you're not certain about your eternal destination, you can be certain about that and give your heart to Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Listen, maybe you've done that. Maybe you've given your heart to Christ, but you're not living for Him. You feel like you're living in lack and you're just burdened down. And, and this message has been significant to you, but nevertheless, you feel like you're not tuned in the way you should be. If that's you this morning, would you rededicate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Let today be a new beginning. And if that is something that you'd like to do, number one, to give your heart to Christ for the first time, or number two, give, rededicate your life to the Lord. When the service is over, some of the pastors are going to be up here. We want to pray for you. And here's how we do it. You pray to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. You pray to rededicate your life to the Lord. And we'll be here available for you to do that at the close of the service. It's been a great Thanksgiving, hasn't it? And it's wonderful when we have an attitude of thankfulness and gratefulness. And I believe with all my heart, when we have that kind of attitude and perception and mindset, it combats negativity. I think we live a healthier life, uh, less stress when we look at things the way God would have us look at them. And that's not ignoring troubles and trials, but that's looking at troubles and trials and saying and declaring, I will have victory over this through Christ Jesus. God bless you.